Hello and welcome to the latest Real People Big Astronomy program. My name is Renee Kerrigan. I am a member of the leadership team of Big Astronomy uh, and I'm coming to you from uh, Peoria, Illinois. I'm uh, the planetarium director at the Peoria Riverfront Museum uh, and I'm also a member of the leadership team of the Big Astronomy program. Big Astronomy is a National Science Foundation funded project that has has a lot of different components and includes a planetarium show that was created by the uh, <clears throat> it was created by California Academy of Sciences uh, and this planetarium show takes you to Chile where you get to meet some of the many diverse people with um, interesting different skills and backgrounds that it takes to make the big observatories happen. Uh, this program also includes uh, research components. So there's research being done on the edu educational um, method of this project by the Michigan State University, and we'll be talking more about that at the end, and hands-on activities uh, related to the program. And finally, these live events. So these events are uh, will directly connect our viewers with STEM professionals who work at the observatories. And today we're very happy to have with us Kathy Vivas, uh, who works at, for the dark energy camera, or works on the dark energy camera at the Blanco Telescope at Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory. Uh, she also does her own research, and, um, but she also works with other astronomers who are doing research on the dark energy camera. And Kathy is going to be telling us a little bit about her job and her life outside of astronomy. So if you are watching and uh, on Facebook and you would like to hear this event uh, interpreted in Spanish, you can do that by joining the Zoom webinar. Uh, and if you're watching in Zoom and you need to um, select what language you would like to hear, just go ahead and do that at the bottom of the Zoom window. Just select interpretation and choose either English or Spanish. Uh, if you have questions along the way, please leave them in the comments of our Facebook event or in Zoom here, and we will do our best to answer them for you at the end. But Kathy, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Nice to, to be here with you. I'm going to share my screen, and um, I will share you the presentation. Um, that you and I put together. If I can find it, I had it, and now I've <laughs> now I've lost it. Um, but but while I'm looking for that, Kathy, can you tell us just a little bit about uh, your job? So I mentioned that you're an astronomer who works for uh, the dark who works on the dark energy camera. Can you tell me just a little bit more about your job? Yes, yeah, so I am astronomer here at Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory. I am based in, in La Serena, Chile. La Serena is the, the city the observatory site in, in Chile. Um, so my work here as an astronomer, it has like two components. Um, one is doing science, doing research, and, and I in particular work in the Milky Way in understanding what kind of stars are in the Milky Way, what are the ages, why, how do, how they, they got, the Milky Way form, um, what was the origin of galaxies like, like the Milky Way, and how are the stars in general that uh, of which the, the Milky Way are made of. And the other component of my job is uh, to work uh, with some of the instruments at Cerro Tololo. And in particular, I am part of the support team of the Dark Energy Camera, which is the most important instrument uh, installed at the four meter Blanco telescope that is featured in the planetarium show that, that um, so large uh, um, camera, digital camera, uh, one of the largest in, in astronomy. And it has the advantage that you can do surveys, large surveys of the skies, large, very large maps of all the sky in different filters in a very efficient uh, way. So it's, it has really uh, given a, a 
a push in many areas of astronomy, including research in the Milky Way and in the stellar populations uh, of the Milky Way. So I distribute my time more or less half and half. Um, as I say, um, uh, a little bit of my research. If you go to the next slide, I can show you like a picture of um, that summarizes what, what I do. Um, uh, okay, so in the in the top figure is Cerro Tololo, where where I do well my my support job, and in the background is the Milky Way. That as I study what kind of stars uh, the Milky Way is made of, and not only the Milky Way, but also the satellite galaxies around the Milky Way. And in that picture, you can see two of those galaxies, which are very easy to see from the southern hemisphere, uh, which are the Magellanic clouds, are those tiny points in the in the left side of the of the picture, like uh, blue clouds. That's what they are called, the Magellanic clouds. Those are two satellites of the Milky Way. Um, the Milky Way has many. Uh, with dark energy camera, with this instrument that I was talking about, um, we have, uh, was, the astronomers have discovered that the Milky Way now has like 50, at least 50 of these very tiny small satellites swirling around the Milky Way. I have some pictures of them in the, in the bottom, um, uh, which are from big, like the Magellanic clouds, to very, very tiny, like the, the ones in the, in the bottom part of, of that figure. With kind of stars to skies, and what's the role of those galaxies in formation, in the formation of galaxies like, like the Milky Way. So the science, my side interests are very well related with what the dark energy camera can do. And, and uh, so I combine good my research with my service work here at Tololo. I help uh, as part of my functional role here at, at Cerro Tololo, I help team of astronomers from around the world, but mostly from the US, uh, that uh, have science projects with dark energy camera in different areas. It could be cosmology, galaxies, uh, uh, Milky Way science. I don't know, there are many things, gravitational rays, there are many, many things. So I, I uh, support their projects. I try to help them to get ready to use the dark energy camera, to get ready uh, to understand how the data uh, has to be images that they can use for, for the, the science interest uh, they have. So probably that summarizes my, my role here uh, at Cerro Tololo. Well, uh, it sounds like a really interesting job and it's so neat that you can do your own research and help other astronomers do research on what a fabulous instrument. Um, I was lucky to get to go to Cerro Tololo back in 2015, and it is just a, a beautiful, wonderful sight. Uh, and, and seeing the night sky from there, I can't imagine being able to observe uh, with that, that fantastic telescope all the time. Um, it sounds like a really interesting, interesting job. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about how you got to be where you are today? Uh, what was your path to your career at Cerro Tololo? Um, there. Um, in Venezuela, you cannot study astronomy as, as, as a career in, in college because it doesn't exist. So I studied physics which is like the closest one to astronomy. And indeed, uh, if you want to do astronomy, you need to know physics because uh, with physics is that you understand what are the laws that are governing uh, the behavior of everything in, in the skies. Uh, so I studied physics uh, with, uh, I did uh, my undergrad um, research work in astronomy. Uh, there is an observatory that is I started uh, doing research as an undergraduate student. Um, when I finished, I went to the US, um, to New Haven, Connecticut. I went to Yale University to do a PhD in astronomy there. I spent six years in, in New Haven, um, studying, uh, well, doing a PhD in astronomy. Uh, most of the time was doing research. Um, when I was there is that uh, I decided to 
to study the Milky Way uh, because I got inspired by, by a, 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 a great professor I had there that inspired me to do uh, research in, in the Milky Way. In, in, this, in particular in the halo of the Milky Way, which is like the more external part uh, of our galaxy, which also contains the oldest stars in, in the Milky Way. And our idea was to, yeah, to understand what was the formation, how the formation of the Milky Way was. staff astronomer at Jano Elat Observatory in the same place where, where I started my studies. But after some time, I, I decided to, to move on and I uh, got this uh, wonderful job here in, in Cerro Tolol Inter-American Observatory. I have been living in Chile for uh, about seven years now. So that's more or less the path uh, that bring me here. So uh, for an astronomer, there is a lot of, of time to, to do studies. It's a, it's a long career because you have to do well college and then a, a PhD, which is five, six more years of studies. Um, and then we'll spend some time doing research and, 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 and doing work at, at observatories. And that's so interesting that you uh, couldn't study astronomy in, in your home, uh, that, that you didn't have a, um, a degree path for astronomy, so you, you took physics. So um, I'm, I, we might have this as a question later on, but I'm just curious, what was it that made you know that you wanted to study astronomy, even when it wasn't a degree that you, you know, had immediately available to you? Yeah, but I should say that it's not that unusual uh, to start a physicist and then move to astronomy. That's a common path for many of, of astronomers today. So um, it, it's, it's like a natural, it's a, a natural way to do astronomy too. So how did I get inspired? I don't know. I think I always wanted to be an astronomer. I liked to read about astronomy. I got inspired with uh, documentary films, with books, with, I don't know, too many things uh, around. And I, I always wanted to be, to be an astronomer. I always tell the, the story um, when I was young about in high school, about the age when you have to really decide, uh, there was a comet passing by. It was the big comet. I'll tell you something about my age. To the so there was a, a lot of media attention about the Halley's comet and everybody wanted to see uh, the comet. And well, my family took, I, I went with my family to, to the observatory, to Janoelat Observatory, which is the one in the one of the observatories shown in the, in the pictures here. Uh, to see the comet from there. So I had uh, like the opportunity of having contact with a professional astronomical facility. And at that moment, it was like clear, that's what I want to do. And that's, that's really what I want to study. And I just started connecting how to do this. And, and, and the path was to study physics um, and then make some specialization in astronomy. Uh, it's really special that uh, that experience, um, you know, helped create that spark, even though it was something you were already interested in, but uh, uh, meeting, you know, getting to see Halley's Comet through a great observatory, it sounds uh, really uh, wonderful. Um, so what would you say the biggest challenge has been in your career and how were you able to deal with it? Well, there are many challenges, of course, but Let's say that um, um, probably one of the biggest challenge, and I could say that it's not only for me, but for many astronomers in my generation, is how to handle a large amount of data. Um, we are in a time in astronomy in which we have very large digital cameras. One of them is, for example, the dark energy camera here that produces huge amounts of data many, many amount of data. So uh, the astronomer needs to develop tools uh, on how to handle uh, those images. In this picture, for example, just you have an idea of what I'm talking about. These are, um, this is in the console room at the telescope. Where we have some monitor just for fun displaying six of the CCDs of the dark energy camera. So each one of these CCDs shows tons of stars, 
it should have around 1 million stars in each one of these screens. And these are six. Dark energy camera has 62 CCDs. So imagine that we could display in only one image, only one, all the stars that we are recording information. It's a lot, it's a lot of data. It's, it's really a lot of data. And, and so uh, for astronomers of my generation, it was like a, um, a change in the paradigm. You would have small CCDs, uh, it was relatively easy to measure. And now this uh, uh, tsunami of data that you, you, you need to develop tools on how to handle them and to understand uh, how to measure all this, obviously in an automatic way, because there is no way that an astronomer can start looking and measuring one star by star, one by one. Uh, there has to be automatic ways uh, developing of algorithms, uh, developing, development of, of statistical analysis of data. And, and that's probably a big challenge. Uh, it's still a challenge. Um, uh, there are uh, some projects, for example, the Vera Rubin Observatory, which is being built uh, right now here in Chile, and it's also featured in the Big Astronomy Planetary Show, uh, that will produce much more data even than the Dark Energy Camera. Uh, so we are still uh, uh, since this challenge. Maybe. So that has been an interesting challenge along all my career. Even when I started studying, uh, I used for my PhD thesis, for example, like which is was like my first um, experience in, in research. I used also a large camera. It was called the Quest camera. It was a, a camera that was built at Yale University, the university where I was doing my PhD, and installed in one of the telescopes in Venezuela. So it was like one of the big uh, mosaic cameras working in astronomy. And at that point, I, I, I started my experience. I get my experience uh, on how to handle big data with that one. That was a small step. Now that Kenyan camera was another big step. And when Vera Rubin comes online, it will be the, the next step. So it's a continuous challenge. This is just to, to I don't know, to, to mention one of the of the challenges in in but that really one of the of the uh, that's the life for a scientist, right? Uh, to get challenges to try to solve them. And that will bring you to a bigger challenge. And, and that's, that has no end. You always are facing new challenges every our time, bigger and bigger. Just, uh, keep getting bigger. Our, our cameras will keep on getting higher resolution and the data will just keep on growing, right? So you'll always be solving that, that challenge. Mm -hmm. I, I've learned from these programs where we've been speaking with astronomers and people who work with astronomy um, that you know, coding using using uh, Python or other types of coding languages is a really uh, larger part of an astronomer's job than something I ever realized. And I think it's because of of that data um, that you all have to sort and deal with, right? Exactly. Probably that was too. For uh, yes, an astronomer today has uh, needs to know how to code because it needs to to develop algorithms to to analyze data because basically everybody is doing big data these days. It's probably in, it's not so computing is a uh, is really skill as that astronomers must have these days. Well, uh, so the biggest challenge is, is, is that big data collection and how to sort all, all of that data you're collecting. But what is your favorite thing about your job and why is that? Observing. Observing. Out, go, observing. Going to, the, to, the, uh, to an observatory and get a night of observing. That's, that's the part that I, I most enjoy about my work. Um, this is a picture of the of the SOAR telescope, which is uh, in the mountain in, uh, in front of, of uh, Cerro Tololo. It's called Cerro Chon, and in Cerro Chon, this part 
telescope, the Gemini telescope, and the Vera Rubin Observatory, which is the one building right now, is also on that mountain top. You can see it from Tololo, it's right, right in front. Uh, so I, uh, this is a picture I took uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, I was heading to our, uh, uh, an observing night. It was very clear, this was the sunset. Um, so I love to be on mountain tops and get a night of observing because observatories are always in like the coolest places in, in Earth. Uh, very beautiful places and getting, uh, well, you say that you were here a few years ago and, and got to enjoy a, a dark night at, at an observatory. So I always enjoy that part. But let, let's say that this is probably like, I don't know, a, a, naive, a naive view of, of what uh, more enjoy. But there is a lot of nice things uh, working here. And I should mention too that um, I love how in my lifetime as an astronomer, uh, we have get answers to many questions that we had. Things that seem impossible to know when I was a student, uh, now is, is pretty common. And so astronomy advances very quickly. Uh, and it's incredible the things that, that we can now see and we can now measure and the answers we have now for many science problems. Of course, those answers also brings more questions. So it's like uh, uh, an endless job because uh, now we have, it's different questions, probably more complex questions. We still have many, many questions, but we have also our answer. I love that in Australia, you can, you can really see changes, changes in, in not only in the way you get data and, and um, how, uh, things have been improving on that side, but also in, in what answers we have been able to, to give. Let me just put you an example. When I was um, starting um, uh, to study um, uh, physics and astronomy, um, so I was in college, um, we always have the, this question, oh, there, are there planets around other stars? And, and the answer was, yeah, probably. Uh, they should be, but we don't have uh, the technology to know if, if that's true. And now we, we know thousands of, of planets around uh, other stars. Uh, and we have planets that are probably similar to Earth around stars that are similar to Sun. And I found that pretty exciting. So we went through, oh no, we it should be, but we can we don't have the technology to now no auto effects of planets. And that was a, like an area that changed, uh, well, completely changed our view on, on, on the exoplanets. And, and like that example, there are many others. So um, I would say that, that besides observing, that's my favorite part in astronomy. See the changes, uh, the changes in the answers and the amazing things that are discovered every day in astronomy. And as an astronomy educator, I, I love that as well, just being able to, um, you know, tell people that those stars that you see in the night sky, they have planets around them, uh, there are solar systems like our own, and we can actually even directly image some of them now. Uh, it's just amazing. Um, so that's pretty wonderful to hear about that perspective of as an astronomer studying it, all those um, things that were once theoretical that now you know and there's still so many questions out there so you'll always have more to study so we asked about your favorite part of your job um what is your least favorite part of your job and why i would say that the, the least favorite part is, is that we don't have enough hours in a day uh, to keep studying astronomy, you want to do many things and there is just no time to, to do them all. So times you get frustrated uh, for that because, I don't know, there are many ideas of, of things to do and you want to get involved in many projects and, and you want more data and you want to do this and that and there is just no time to do this. So um, that would say is, is my uh, less favorite part because then it puts you a lot of pressure, probably it's, um, uh, it's pressure that is self-inflicted because, well, you should know that you can do only such and such things, but you always want to do more. And, and there is just no time to do it. Um, so, yeah. 
Kathy, we have some folks watching uh, on on the uh, Facebook and, and they're commenting how much they enjoy your enthusiasm for your job. Uh, and I, I do as well. Um, I, I, do enjoy, I do enjoy my, my work a lot. <laughs> well, then can you, I'm sure you can tell us about your favorite astronomical object. What's your favorite uh, thing to observe? So this is a really easy um, answer for me. It's, are our LIDAR stars. And I have been working on our LIDAR stars all my life, and I still find those are uh, the most wonderful objects in, in the sky. So the RR LIDAR stars are variable stars. I'm not sure if, um, in principle, that picture should be like a movie. Um, maybe you have to click again, that, uh, give a click, or in the picture. I'm not, sure, I don't, I'm not sure if it's going to work. But there are stars that change the brightness. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, stars change back. Uh, they get brighter, they get dimmer, they get brighter, they get dimmer. Most of the objects in the, in the sky, uh, you cannot see any changes. But a few ones change uh, for different reasons. And there are, in particular, some kind of stars uh, that are very old stars. And they change the brightness. Uh, so uh, these stars were discovered uh, more than 100 years ago. Uh, the discoverer of, of these stars was uh, Wilhelmina Fleming, which was one of the, what uh, they, they were called the Harvard uh, computers. So it was this group of women that made a lot of, 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 of analyzing uh, uh, photographic data in astronomy. And one of them, Wilhelmina Fleming, realized that some stars uh, change the brightness with a very, uh, very special uh, pattern. Uh, and they were called Aralaira stars because of the stars are So the nice things about the Aralaira stars is that uh, we know today that they are very old stars, uh, almost as old as the universe. So by observing the Aralaira stars, it's like having fossil records of the formation of the Milky Way. You are getting, you are observing some of the oldest objects in the Milky Way. So it's like in Earth looking for uh, dinosaur bones. Uh, they will tell you a lot about the, the first stages in, in Earth, in life in Earth. Here is more or less the old things in about the mission of Milky Way. So I've been searching for other lighter stars as a tool to understand the formation, the early times, the formation of the, of the Milky Way. They are good uh, because not only they are old, but they are also uh, what we call a standard candles. They are distance indicators. To measure distances in astronomy is very hard in general, but if you have another light star, you can say exactly at what distance that star is. And that means that you can make like 3D maps of the sky. And when you have 3D maps of the sky, you can start to see things that, that you usually don't, don't, don't see. So for example, in one of the, of the research projects that um, I have been involved in the past was to do like large maps of the hail of the Milky Way, of the external parts of the Milky Way. And we realized that the other light stars were not distributed in a uniform way. But they were like in a special, like in, in kind of clouds, like in, in this. And we now understand that uh, those are uh, debris of satellite galaxies that have been destroyed by the Milky Way. We believe today that the Milky Way formed by the accretion of many small galaxies that by gravitational forces are, are, uh, are, are being disrupted. Uh, and, and the Milky Way like kind of takes away all the stars in these tiny galaxies and they live like rivers in the, in the hail of the Milky Way. They live like streams. They are actually called stellar streams. So the first clue that we had uh, for stellar streams was based on other lighter stars. So that was, I like these objects because they are very useful to, to do what we call uh, archaeoastronomy, to do, uh, to study the origin of the Milky Way. So. As I say, I've been uh, doing science with other light stars for years, uh, and, and I look for the things. Uh,
kind of did an, um, um, and try to get information of, of these images. We measure the brightness of all the stars. And I actually do it many, many times along several hours or several days. And I look for stars that do change brightness. As I say, they are very little. You can have one million stars and only a handful are going to be uh, other like the stars. So it's, it's really hard to look for them. And I have been dedicating my life to, to find these stars, to, to find these stars in the Milky Way and also find these stars in the satellites of the, of the, of the, of the, in the satellite galaxies of the Milky Way. So uh, that one, as I say, is uh, an easy question. It's my favorite object is, is an other light like star. And what a great, a, a great explanation for how useful they are. Uh, and no wonder they're your favorite objects. I love hearing you describe how the Milky Way formed by tearing apart other small uh, galaxies and creating those stellar streams. That's fascinating. Uh, and of course, I know that the Blanca telescope has been um, looking for stars like that and other standard candles uh, and lots of different it's been used to look for those objects for a long time to be able to help understand um, the age of our Milky Way and, and our universe. Uh, so uh, you've talked a lot about your job and how much you love your job and, and you have told us a little bit about how, you know what your daily life is like but if, maybe if there's things you haven't shared yet what's the a daily life like for you uh, at your job? So every day is different um, and that's one nice thing because uh, you, you don't get bored here because every, every day you are facing different tasks, different challenges. Um, so I try to put here like some pictures of, of, of things I do. So uh, in the top part, for example, I have the uh, that's one thing that I do. I, I work with astronomers that come to Chile to observe uh, and, and I spend some time with them and I, I uh, teach them how to use the dark energy camera, uh, how to use the, how to get the data. Uh, so that, that's what, that's part of my job to, to talk with astronomers that come and be sure that they are, that they are getting the, the data they need for, for their science projects. Uh, so that's one thing. Um, as a scientist, we communicate the results of our research in conferences. Uh, there are many conferences in astronomy uh, around the world. Uh, uh, these days, of course, they are virtual conferences, but at some point uh, <laughs> in another life, it seems now, uh, we meet in different places in the world to discuss results in particular. So, Of, of our communication results, and we can communicate them in conferences and also in writing um, in writing astronomical papers, scientific papers that are published on journals which are specialized in astronomy. Of course, to do that, you have to do a lot of, of analysis of your data. I'm showing just some plots that I may be doing to analyze. Uh, I don't know, the, the position of the stars in the sky or their colors and magnitudes and what does it mean? Um, as I say, I, I have to look in the data to, to find stars that are changing brightness as an um, Regarding communication, we also need to do also communication to the general public. So from time to time, I also give talks at uh, a school. So there is uh, one picture of that uh, in the in the bottom part of the of the screen. Uh, what you tell kids on on, on science, the science we do that's that's part of our responsibility as science uh, scientists to to communicate uh, what things uh, we are doing. And, and I have a picture also on how we do observations this day. I, I told you before that my favorite part is if, if going to the observatory, but um, in the last year we have to be, we have to, to go virtually, only virtually to the observatory. So I have here my setup, which is uh, from home, on how do I do observations these days. So uh, you need several screens around, uh, but you can do, you can manage, and in particular, These days. It's not as nice 
as going to the mountain, of course, but, but we still get the data and, and, and we do the job, the job done. So, as I say, it, there are many different things depending on, on, on if you have nighttime observations or not, things changes, but there is a variety of things that, uh, that an astronomer can, uh, an astronomer working at an observatory can do. I love that you said that one of your responsibilities as a scientist is to help communicate and educate other people about uh, the science that you do. And, and I think you, you do a wonderful job at that. I uh, really enjoyed uh, talking with you today so far and learning about your job. Um, and I know we did it, you didn't, uh, we don't have any pictures for this one, but would you care to describe? So right now you work at home, so maybe a typical day at home and a typical day at work look similar, but what are some things that, um, make up your home life? Yes. Typically at home since year is exactly what I say before. Um, because of the pandemic, we have been working from home. Um, it is, it is, I, I still find amazing that in these days we can, we can still do our job. And because from home, we have all the tools necessary. We can, this couldn't have happened a, a I don't know, 10 or 20 years ago, it would have been much harder to, to survive the pandemic and to be efficient during, the, during a pandemic um, uh, some time ago. But today we have the tools um, and we can do uh, most of our job from, from home. So th on the other hand, that's one of the, of the difficulties of these times to separate uh, what is your job and what is your activities from home. So I, I, this is happening to everybody and, and we are no exception, of, of course. Uh, but at home, well, I, I enjoy my main activity. I, uh, I love to, to do uh, family things and, and spend some time with them. So you told us, I think, because we talked about what you enjoyed um, studying, but what, what is your favorite subject that you studied in school? Yeah, when I was, I, I, I always liked math. That, that was my, my strongest point and I love uh, to do math. And um, at some point I say, if I'm not going to be an astronomer, I, I would like to be a mathematician. So for sure, I, that was my favorite subject uh, in school and it was like uh, probably what, what I most enjoy uh, when, I was, uh, when I was a kid in school. Um, and as I turns out, uh, well, uh, you need math if you want to be a, a scientist. That's a, an essential tool. Um, so, what about your uh, least favorite subject in school? I, I'm actually quite embarrassed by that question, and, and <laughs> I, I mean, I shouldn't say it was uh, physical education. It was PE. I, I hated it. I'm not a sport person. And I am very ashamed of that because I, I realize how important that is. Uh, but well, that's life, right? That's, I, I didn't like it at all. Uh, <laughs> at They're all. Uh, they like uh, and don't like, school, right? Actually, I, I, and I was, yeah, I was very bad, but I was so good in, in math and in other subjects that my teachers were kind of kind to me uh, <laughs> uh, regarding physical education and they were very soft with me. Um, uh, but yeah, I, because I, it, I, but, but it's very important. I shouldn't. <laughs> we, our last question we had for you is what do you like to do for fun? And you have a picture of outside, like perhaps you like to hike, which seems like um, physical education. <laughs> physical education in a classroom. Yeah, no, that's yeah, my favorite activity is. Uh, outside work is, is hiking. So I always do it or as frequent as I can. Uh, um, yeah, that's, that's it. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Kathy, for sharing with us some of uh, your job and, and what you uh, do at, at the observatory and what you like to do at home uh, and just helping people have a better understanding, I hope, of, um, you know, that it's, the people who work in science facilities are complete people, that they're not just 
um, interested in astronomy. They're interested in other things as well. Uh, and of course, it sound, I know you're very passionate about astronomy, but it's, it's good to see people as a, as a whole person, I think. Um, we do have some questions from our audience. Um, some in Zoom here and some on Facebook. And if you're watching and if you have any questions for Kathy about her research, about her job, or, um, or you know, anything else, just go ahead and uh, let us know in the comments um, and we will try to answer them for you. So we did have one question here in the Zoom uh, webinar from Rick. Um, why do stars vary, the stars that you study, that you spoke of, um, why do they vary in brightness? Do they all vary in the same pattern or way or cycle or is it different? They study the other light stars, they change because they get unstable in the interior. And when they get unstable, they like change size. They get smaller, but then get bigger and smaller and bigger. It's because instability is in the inside of the stars. It's like they were somehow briefing. And when they get large, they get brighter. And when they get small, they get, uh, uh, they get dimmer. So uh, we call these types of stars pulsating because that's what they are doing. They are pulsating, larger, smaller, larger, smaller. And that's the, the, like the physical reason why they are changing brightness. But it's not the, not the only way a star can change brightness. We have in the sky, we can see, for example, many eclipsing binaries. And an eclipsing binary will change brightness, not because the star is, is nothing is happening the inside of those stars, but there is uh, two stars together, very close together, and one is orbiting the stars, and then you get the star dimmer. And, and that's another way, for example, to, to, to change the brightness of a star. In those cases, those are binary stars. There are other reasons. There are the stars that explode, and then at the end of the light, they just go boom, and of course, they get very bright at that moment. Uh, and that's another mechanism different. But the, for the other light stars, which are the ones that I study, is pulsation. They are pulsating. Thank you, Kathy. Um, Pat, who's watching on Facebook, would like to know, what is the best hour um, or time of night to observe the Southern Hemisphere sky? Um, uh, that would be, I, I guess uh, this is somebody asking from the Northern Hemisphere uh, 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 how to look at it's probably richer in stars and, and in, in nice things to see than the, than the northern sky. So probably the most amazing part is when you see the bulge, which is like the central part of the Milky Way because it's like the most dramatic one. Those are, uh, that's visible mostly in July, more or less. Uh, yeah, say early in the night during, during July from the northern hemisphere. It, the, the, the exact times it will depend on, on where exactly the, the person who is asking this question is. Uh, but um, if you can come some day to either Chile to, I don't know, any place in the southern hemisphere, please do enjoy the sky. Uh, try to look for the Magellanic clouds. The Magellanic clouds are objects that are visible uh, to the naked eye but you cannot see them from, from the US, for example, uh, because they are really in the, they are very, very in the South. And that's one of the most useful to the, to the South. Uh, it, it, that, so the magnetic clouds, the, the central part of the Milky Way, those, those are things that, that are better viewed from the, from the Southern Hemisphere. And the southern hemisphere sky is really remarkable. The Chilean sky is really remarkable. Uh, there's a reason that we're building, we the world is building so many telescopes in Chile. Uh, there's so many uh, clear nights in Chile and uh, really beautiful uh, night skies. Um, I was blown away by the night sky when I had the opportunity to go to some of these observatories in Chile. 
Okay, so there's another question here, and it's okay, Kathy, if you don't want to answer this one, I think, because it's a little bit specific, but uh, we've had a couple questions about uh, when you started working as an astronomer. I think they're curious about how long you've been working in astronomy. So, uh, well, let's um, start, you, you have to study first, right? If you want to do research in astronomy, it's not only going to college to, to get a major in astronomy, then you have, you really need to do to graduate school uh, because there is a lot of tools that you need to learn. There is a lot of, of, of experience you need to have in research. Um, in order to be able to, to work as an astronomer. So it's a long path. You have to do college and then you have to, uh, to, do, uh, to go to graduate school. And then you can start working as an astronomer. So I don't know, but that's more or less the path uh, uh, that which is like four or five years of college and five years of graduate school, that, that would be more or less the path. And then, and then you, you can really work as an astronomer. Um. Rick also wants to know, uh, and this is a great question, it's a complicated answer, I think. Can you explain more about dark energy? When you observing, when you or other astronomers are observing through the dark energy camera, what are you looking for? Uh, what are you looking for related with? Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a nice question, but it's a very good question. And actually, yeah, dark energy camera has their its name because uh, the goal of the collaboration that built this instrument was to, to try to understand better what dark matter is. Um, so dark matter is something that we know is there that fills the universe, but we don't know what it is. Um, and that's one of the biggest for me today. Or, or, or we see the effects of dark, uh, of dark energy and dark matter. Um, but we don't know exactly what it is. So the goal is to understand better how, what, what these effects are, because if we understand better the effects, then we can try to, to eventually know what, what that matter is made of. Uh, so what, I, I, I do not work in this area, that's, that's not my, I use a lot of dark energy camera, but to study stars, like, to study the, the Milky Way, the stars that are much closer, uh, closer by. But the people that are studying uh, dark matter and dark energy are looking especially to very distant galaxies, very, very distant galaxies. So they look several things. They look, for example, uh, the distribution of galaxies in the universe, because how the galaxies are distributed in the universe at the end, it will depend on, on what, how, on, on how dark uh, they are example at supernovas stars that explode in very distant galaxies because they are also standard candles we can get the distances to those um, to those uh, very distant galaxies and they can measure if the universe is accelerating How, or, uh, we know that it's accelerating that the universe is getting bigger and bigger uh, every time and and the reason for that is dark energy and then if we know exactly uh, how the acceleration is, we can know more about uh, what the dark energy is. So, so in, in, in few words, uh, uh, the people that study dark uh, matter and dark energy are most interested in looking at very, very distant galaxies. Kathy, you have done such a wonderful job uh, answering questions and, and sharing your enthusiasm for your job. It's been really fantastic to talk with you. And we do have more questions, but unfortunately we are uh, coming in on the hour. Uh, and I know that Kathy is a, is a busy lady. I don't wanna take up too much of her time today. Um, so to, to wrap things up, I just like to mention that um, this project is a part of a National Science Foundation funded project and there's educational research that is done um, about this project and how it helps people learn and Jessica is a member of the research team and uh, would like to say a few things about that. Hi everyone, like Renee said, this is an NSF funded project and as part of that the research team is conducting education research around the project itself. 
So if you'd like to help us out, we would really love it if you could. You can help us out by filling out the survey that will be showing up in the comments shortly. Um, if you fill out that survey, you'll be entered in to win a $10 gift card to Amazon. Another way you can help us out is during the survey, you can opt in to talk with us two times over the next few months and afterwards receive a $40 gift card to Amazon. So if you'd really like the help, we would really appreciate it and thank you so much. Thank you, Jessica. And I hope that you will take the time to fill out that survey that Jessica has put in the comment section of the uh, Zoom program here. And we'll also get it uh, in the Facebook comments as well. It just got posted there in the Facebook comments. Um, and I'd like to mention that this series of events, this Real People Big Astronomy ser event series that uh, connects you with folks who works at who work at the observatories in different jobs uh, is ongoing and the next one is in February. It's on February 18th um, and we'll be talking with Alex Geraldo who is actually in charge of the cocinas or the cafeteria uh, at CTIO and at Gemini South. So that'll be fun because it's a different type of job and we've had the opportunity to learn about and it's, it's vitally important to everyone who works at the observatories. Everyone uh, needs to eat and he takes care of the people uh, who work at the observatories in that way. So if you'd like to um, sign up for our mailing list to be notified about the upcoming events, you can do so at bigastronomy.org. Please, if you do not, do not already, like us on Facebook so that you can see these live events right in your news feed uh, and we'll be back in February with uh, that next live event. And I've just remembered as I'm speaking um, that actually the next one is um, in January, January 28th, I believe. Um, I will put the information up on our Facebook uh, very soon. We'll be doing an activity demonstration with Vivian White of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. Uh, so one of the educational activities that's associated with this project. But let's all give a virtual round of applause to Dr. Kathy Vivas, thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. I really enjoyed learning from you. Uh, and uh, I'd like to bottle up some of your enthusiasm and take it with me into 2021. I think that's a good spirit for the year. Um, thank you everyone for watching. And uh, please do fill out those surveys if you're interested in helping us out. Uh, have a great day.